on-time local news, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. It's heating up slowly but surely in the border city, and by heating up, I mean it's getting back to average temperatures for this time of the year. Welcome back to Primetime Local News. Abby St. John, Josh Ryan, news, weather, sports, and more coming up over the next hour as we head into a very busy weekend in the city for sports when you have football and uh, basketball exhibition, hockey, and then a lot of uh, charity events like the Rescue Squad Gala this weekend, uh, the art battle tomorrow. Really not not a lot of excuses for not finding something to do. Yeah, exactly. It's always it's always around the fall. Um, like you said, all the sports are starting, especially school sports. Sports yeah. are all starting up, and then you have the, the end of um, like the summer charity yeah. events coming into the fall slash Christmas charity events. So it's going to be a busy couple of months. Yeah, which I'm looking forward to being able to cover all of those certainly, as are the rest of our cast here at. Uh, uh, prime time. Remember though, Eric Bay is up next. We'll head out to him. He was on location earlier. Thanks guys. Today we are here at the Economic Partnership Summit held here at the Lloyd X today. And now what that is, is it's trying to promote economic partnerships here throughout Indigenous peoples in this kind of area around Lloydminster, throughout the surrounding area as well. So today we are going to be talking with a few people, including one of the co-creators of this event in the first place, and talk about the work he's doing here, and also on a larger global scale. So we're going to have all that and more here throughout the show, but before that we're going to head back into the studio and take a look at your local news. There are plenty of battles to look forward to in the border city, on the ice, and the gridiron. But if you're looking for something with a little more visual flair, Rolling Green's Fairways has you covered tomorrow evening, and Josh Ryan has more. In the third go-around of Art Battle Lloyd Minster, new talent will be on display. We have some new artists that will be participating this time. This will be their first art battle, so it will be pretty exciting for them. Twelve artists are split into two rounds where precision and efficiency are equally important to earn one of four final spots. Each of those rounds is 20 minutes long. Final round, four artists go against each other, audience votes for the winner, and then the winner of this event will go on to regionals in Edmonton. What's also unique is how active the audience participation is. You have to get up and actually walk around. There's a circle of easels in the middle, and we call it the slow tornado. Everybody walks around so you can see the paintings developing in that 20 minutes and see what happens. Um, so it's really exciting when you're walking around the circle and you see a painting and you walk around and you come around and see it again, and it could be like 30 seconds later and it's a totally different painting already. This year's event is also encouraging more family attendance in order to inspire a new generation. We've taken some uh, complimentary tickets to the schools to pass on to some of the kids that might be really interested in art, that uh, would like to see actual working artists in Lloydminster and see what they do. And that focus on younger artists is also in pricing, with tickets still available online and at the door. We have a special uh, youth pricing, so those tickets are a little cheaper. Josh Ryan, Primetime Local News. A citywide scavenger hunt has been taking over the border city this week. On the Border Bake Shop has been hiding envelopes full of money in popular, lo popular locations in town. And our Jasmine King finds out why. In honor of On the Border Bake Shop's anniversary, instead of giving away free cupcakes and other items where they could have run into the problem of those with allergies, they thought of the one thing everyone likes, money. We're coming up on our five year anniversary and uh, we're just very thankful for having the five years and we wanted to thank the community and have a, a way of getting them outside and we thought who doesn't love a scavenger hunt? So we have 10 envelopes filled with $10 and a little note saying from On the Border Bake Shop. In order to give everyone who wants to take part in the scavenger hunt a fair chance, they post the pictures of the area the envelopes are hidden in on their social media. We post on our social media accounts twice a day, one in the morning, one after work, with a picture and a clue. And the response has been fantastic. It's a great way for us to be interactive with our customers online. They wanted to come up with an idea on how to thank the community that has been supporting them in a special way. We thought like scavenger hunts are fun, people love money, it's, it's just something new that we haven't done and we just tried it out. It's been fun uh, seeing people's posts, either their pictures of them finding it or we had someone post a video of other people looking for it as well, which is fun, um, people calling. At the end of the day, they are just glad they got to celebrate five years in the border city.
It's it's fantastic. Uh, the last five years have been, as everyone knows, has been a little hard, but uh, we're very thankful for the community support and uh, just wanted to do a little something, a little thank you. They will be continuing to give away more envelopes for the rest of the week and are considering doing this event again for their next anniversary. Jasmine King, Primetime Local News. Young kids are learning a thing or two about traditional Irish dance. Celtic Jewel Irish Dance held a workshop last night for anyone wanting to get a feel of what Irish dancing is. It's just a trial, so if there's a lot of people that don't understand what it actually is, so we're just doing trials, so you can come and see if you like to do the kind of dance, and so you don't aren't like stuck in doing the whole year and then end up not liking it halfway through. Irish dancing has been Sydney Cayudin's passion for 12 years. She started teaching the dance four years ago. I kind of always wanted to be a dancer when I moved to Vermilion. So, and when my mom found out that there was a, a dance school in Vermilion that offered Irish, that's how I got into it and then ended up falling in love with it. And hopefully it will stay my passion forever. And Sydney wants others to learn more about Irish dance through her passion. For more information about Irish dancing, visit Celtic Jewel Irish Dance on Facebook. Officers are baffled at the disappearance of Constable Scarecrow. One of multiple meadow cutouts of police officer, the Lloydminster RCMP is requesting the public's assistance in locating him. Constable Scarecrow was last seen in the area of Anniversary Park on 39th Street on September 28th. Constable Scarecrow is described as a 6 foot 2 inch weighing less than 25 pounds and wearing all green. If you have any information in regards to Constable Scarecrow's whereabouts, contact the Lloyd Lloydminster RCMP or Crime Stoppers. Now we're going to Eric Bay who is on location today. Once again, we are back here at the Economic Partnership Summit today, and I'm joined now by Milton Tatusis, one of the founding members here in Lloydminster. So first off, can you give us maybe a little background as to what exactly is going on here today? Well, it's essentially about uh, getting two communities together that historically have not uh, had a good business relationship or uh, not as extensive as it should have been. So again, it's just getting educating the uh, non-Indigenous community by and large about the success we are seeing in our community, in the First Nations community, the Indigenous community. So it's, it's really about educating and uh, getting people together to start having dialogues about what, what business success should look, look like in the near future. And now I did mention you are one of the founding members. So can you talk, uh, how long ago did you actually help found this and what was kind of the reason behind it or the importance of starting this up? Well, the conversation started about eight years ago when I was with the Office of the Treaty Commissioner as the Director for Livelihood and Economic uh, Development. Uh, again, it's just a, a discussion we had. Uh, there was a little pushback. We kept pushing back <laughs> and convinced the community here to have a, a gathering uh, of this nature. And since then, uh, it's, it's taken off. We've had many uh, very prominent speakers from the Indigenous business community here over the, over the past seven years. So I think it's been very successful so far. All right, thank you for this, and we are going to have some more from back here once again with Milton, continuing to talk about the Economic Partnership Summit here in Lloydminster, but before that, we are going to head back into the studio. Thank you, eBay. Nine degrees with a fair amount of sunlight once again in the border city. It's been a solid couple of days, even though it's a little cooler than the seasonal average. That shouldn't be the case over the next couple of days, where we'll get right back up to those normal temperatures for this time of the year. 27 and minus 8 are your record high and lows from 1992 and the year 2000. Uh, the wind, once again, stronger than anticipated. We're getting around 27, 20, 28 kilometers at the moment. We've had some gusts in the 30 kilometer range. Uh, much more stringent than the 19 kilometer average we were expecting yesterday. Uh, satellite and radar showing again relatively minimal cloud cover, though there is a low pressure system building at the corner of your map. They're making its way into the mountains and the uh, southwest section of Alberta. That could uh, be in play on Saturday where we are expecting a little bit of rainfall. Current temperatures here 12 degrees in Edmonton, 10 in Edson and 7 out in Jasper in the mountains. Uh, Cold Lake at 12 degrees, Meadow Lake 13, Prince Albert at 9, 
Melford out in Saskatchewan at 10 degrees, also 12 in Saskatoon, a little cooler in North Battleford at 10 degrees, and you can see Lloydminster sitting at 9 degrees again at the moment. Overnight low of 2 and then a high of 12 tomorrow. Uh, North Battleford, similar temperatures, they're expecting 13 degrees. Cold Lake should get up to 11, while Wainwright should get to 12, and Bonneville could get to 11. Both of those areas still in the plus. Uh, Wainwright sitting at 11 degrees at the moment, Bonneville at 12 degrees, and uh, should be a calm down as well as a uh, cool down overnight. Calm down in terms of wind speeds. Uh, your school day forecast, 3 degrees by 8 a.m., 5 at recess, 8 at lunch, and 12 when everyone gets out of school. And again, that should be your high for Friday. 10 degrees Saturday with a chance of rain. Starts, warm, starts to warm up once again on Sunday, as well as brighten up a high of 13 and a low of 3. That's been your three-day forecast. Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Welcome back. We're moving oil field and agriculture products across Western Canada. Soar Oil Field has built up its company from one truck and trailer while remaining a family run business. Eric Bay has more in this week's BioClean Business Bio. Owner Harry Martin says his goal when he began his company was to own five trailers, never imagining it would grow to the size it is today. In 2002, I was offered uh, to go independent. We started out with one tractor and then 2004 we bought our first trailer. After that we expanded and bought a few more trailers and it's, you know, the dream was five trailers and uh, have just over 100 now. With those trailers, Soar Oilfield moves companies' product in both the oil and ag sectors around the prairies. Logistics services for the oil field for fluid, uh, drill fluid, frac fluid, uh, pipeline oil, emulsion, water, and uh, the ag side we have uh, granular liquid fertilizer grain. Through it all, Soar Oilfield has remained proudly family run and owned, something Martins calls a blessing. I was always warned it was not a good thing to work with family. Uh, it's been a big privilege to work with the group that I work with. Um, they've accepted the whole family as management in one, you know, one part or the other. And uh, it's, it's, been absolutely fantastic for the family. More can be found at Soar Oil Fields website. And that's this week's BioClean Business Bio. Business Bio, brought to you by BioClean. Call the Bio Team, 1 866 8326. The Disaster Specialists. Questions were being asked in Saskatoon about how a senior who was last seen walking into a hospital on the weekend was found dead there three days later. The body of 72-year-old Alan Landry was discovered on the main floor of the Royal University Hospital Tuesday night. The Provincial Health Authority says he was found in an area accessible to the public. Saskatoon police say there was a complete search of the hospital and surrounding area after he was reported missing on Saturday. Officials say his death is not considered suspicious. Coming up after the break, we'll have your egg and sports. Welcome back. Well, the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment is asking hunters to submit the heads of their harvest for chronic wasting diseases testing. Eric Bay has more on how CWD affects cervids and what producers can do to protect themselves in this week's Ag Report. Saskatchewan has seen a higher number of cases of chronic wasting disease, which attacks the central nervous system of members of the deer family, leading to the animal's death. So CWD is uh, an infectious uh, disease that affects uh, members of the deer family, which uh, include moose, elk, white-tailed deer, mule deer, and caribou. And uh, there's no known cure for CWD. It affects their central nervous system. 
While no cases have been confirmed in the caribou population, this increase in CWD has caused concern that the disease could reach caribou. We do know that uh, reindeer have contracted uh, CWD in other countries and they are basically the same species as our caribou and so we have no known incidence of uh, CWD infected caribou however there is um, CWD along the forest fringe particularly in the northeastern farmland that would be adjacent to uh, traditional caribou range. Originally introduced to Saskatchewan through provincial game farm animals in 1996, there is concern local farm animals could be at risk. In, in fact, uh, CWD was brought to the province by an imported uh, game farm animal and then spread to wildlife. And so in the same way, uh, infected wildlife uh, could um uh, uh, through contact uh, with game farm animals, they could spread it the other way too. To keep their animals safe, producers are encouraged to monitor the source of their animal feed and may be eligible for funding to provide double fencing around their herd through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Agreement. Eric Bay, Primetime Local News. This ag report is brought to you by the Lloydminster Co-op Agro Centre. Depend on them for product, tools and expert advice. Shop at your local Lloyd Co-op Agro Centre with branch locations in Lashburn and Neilburg. That's all for Ag. Sports is next. Last weekend at the Boundary Battle of Alberta, stars gathered to raise money and awareness for mental health. Some of the players who showed up might not have been all stars of the league, but some players in their position could use the help. Our Evan Kenny reports. The Enforcer. Here we go. He he the the center. Yeah, he took the face off. One of the most unforgiving and unrewarding positions in professional sports. Players in this position put their bodies on the line every game, every shift, and every second. I think I'm fortunate. Uh, I mean, I can just judge on, on how I feel. Uh, I, th I think I'm okay, but it's definitely a concern. I mean, hits to the head, and it's a physical game. I was very lucky to play it, and I wouldn't take anything back. But You know, myself being in that role as well, I, I, I played that role. I know it's a difficult role, and especially with a number of players that have played that role that have suffered mental illness um, it has certainly opened my eyes. The enforcers started to be recognized after their careers back in 2009 when Reggie Fleming passed away and is the first hockey player to be tied to CTE. The trend of enforcers leaving too early continues still today. Players like Derek Bugard, Wade Belak, Steve Montador and one of the all-time best fighters Bob Probert all dealt with mental health problems. Every athlete, uh, you know, gets, uh, gets to fight anxiety, you know, in a sport. You know, you're a sport of competition that you have to be the best at all time, and uh, there's always somebody there to try to take your spot. So, Some players, like LaRock, say the NHL needs to take bigger steps after players are finished their career. It's sad that uh, some guys didn't have the help that they, they could have had earlier, and the situation today would have been way better. Some of them is too late, some of them passed away. Once you're done, you're done. And really, you're not getting calls from the, the players associate. Nobody, to be honest with you, nobody really cares. The tough guys are now in the battle to fight mental illness instead of each other. Evan Kenny, Primetime Local Sports. Now we're going to Eric Bay, who is on location today. Once again, we are back here at the Economic Partnership Summit here today, and once again, Milton Tatusis joins me here. So first off, can you give us a little background as to how this has grown? I know once we, we said you are the, one of the founding members, so how this event has grown here in Lloydminster? Well, I think it's grown leaps and bounds. Even from last year alone, the delegate registration uh, by the mainstream corporate business community has increased by about 50%. So I think that's a, a huge success. This is all, uh, I think, uh, signifying the, the importance of these kinds of educational uh, relationship building events. And this is happening across the country and indeed around the world. 
and you mentioned that around the world, and you are actually a part of that kind of around the world. So can you talk about the importance of having that spread out, starting out here, and then again going around the world into those bigger centers? That's right. Well, almost uh, a decade ago, we started this concept uh, uh, called the World Indigenous Business Forum. Uh, with a group out of Manitoba and we've since taken that forum from New York City with a small, very small gathering to uh, places like New Zealand, Africa, Central America, South America, Hawaii uh, and so on. So this next week I'm on my way to Vancouver uh, to attend the, the World Indigenous Business Forum where we'll be having similar discussion, dialogue and, and uh, really it's a, an inspiring event where stories will be shared about it's the great success and tremendous strides Indigenous communities globally are making. Um, and so again, it's, 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 a, it's a, something like what we're doing here in Lloydminster, but on a grander scale. And then once again, you did mention about eight years ago, this idea had started here in Lloydminster. So can you talk about the growth here and then I guess around the world as well of events like these? Well, it's been, uh, it's been uh, initially it was difficult to get started, but uh, we've been successful at attracting uh, leaders like Chief Darcy Bear, Tammy Cook Searson, Clarence Louis, Robert Louis, uh, some of the very prominent uh, First Nations leaders from Western Canada. Uh, again, uh, it's been a tremendous experience. Uh, I think we've inspired a lot of people. Now today we have the new Gold Horse Casino in Lloydminster. Uh, hopefully that'll be a, a stepping stone to other uh, business developments uh, for this economic region. Thank you for this, and we're going to have some more from back here once again at the Economic Partnership Summit, but before that, we are going to head back into the studio. Thanks again, eBay. Your next 24 hours here, starting to see a little bit of cloud cover creeping into the Lloydminster region uh, overnight, and then a little bit more making its way further east. You can see, again, a low-pressure system that will bring in a little bit of cool air, also a chance of some precipitation as well. Most of it will miss the region, but we have about a 50% chance, according to some reports, that there could be some rain on Saturday. Fortunately, not looking at any snow at the moment. Then again, southern Alberta did get hit rather suddenly, and the reports didn't give you a lot of pre-warning, so one never knows in the prairies. Again, largely clear skies, but some clouds will make their way through over the course of Friday. A few national temperatures quickly to peak at 12 in Edmonton and 14 out in Vancouver. Some of these areas have cooled down a little bit over the past couple of hours. Whitehorse up in the northwest at 9 degrees there. 8 in both Regina and in Winnipeg. 12 in Toronto, which has continued to cool down since the beginning of the week. 7 in Quebec City and 8 out in Halifax on the coast. St. John's uh, starting to darken a little bit there in the evening. They're at 4 degrees at the moment. On this, the Alberta side of your region here, St. Paul at 11 degrees, same for Bonneville, Lac La Biche 12 degrees, along with Vegreville and Edmonton, Vermilion and Wainwright both sitting at 11 degrees. And on the SAS side, 11 degrees goes through the entire northeastern part of your map, including St. Wahlberg, uh, Maidstone 9 degrees, North Battleford 10 degrees, Macklin also at 11 degrees. And again, all of these regions largely have experienced sunlight through most of the day, such as North Battleford currently sitting at 10. They'll have a low of 4 overnight where they are going to get a little bit of cloud cover. Uh, and then 13 degrees tomorrow, a mix of sun and cloud, but mostly sun. And a few calmer winds certainly than they're getting at the moment with winds out of the southeast, uh, timed out to at least 22 to, to 25 kilometers per hour. Uh, Cold Lake 12 degrees dropping to 3 overnight. They should get back to 11 by tomorrow, but they'll have a little bit of cloud cover to deal with as the wind shifts to the south southwest. And here in the border city, we're looking at a uh, current temperature of 12 degrees and we should drop down to about 2 degrees overnight, uh, 9 degrees, sorry, at the moment. Then 12 is the high for tomorrow. South southeast winds again, that'll be a shift to the west southwest tomorrow. Not expecting the stringent winds we got today, but we were also predicting around 18, 19 kilometers per hour. Instead, we ended up with nearly 30 kilometers per hour. So things could change certainly when it comes to the wind. Also, again, we'll see a little bit of cloud cover tomorrow in addition to uh, some sun as well. So when it does get cloudy, it'll get very cloudy indeed. Saturday, again, expecting to be cloudy as well, where we could get that chance of rain. Sunday, Monday should be uh, a little warmer and a little sunnier, certainly. Uh, your high of 16 on Monday should be the high of the week. 10 degrees Saturday, 13 Sunday, the 16 on Monday. Then a drop off to on Tuesday where there's an outside chance of maybe a few millimeters of snow, five degrees for the high, then two on Wednesday, a slight rebound to six on Thursday, but we'll end the seven days with minus four for the low on Wednesday, minus five for the low on Thursday.
prime time local news serving the Lakeland and Midwest region. We're looking at a developing story in Niagara Falls where a 25 year old mother has been charged with first degree murder in the death of her infant daughter. Police were called to the residence Wednesday afternoon and say the six month old was found without vital signs. The baby was pronounced dead in hospital. A bail hearing for the accused will be held in the morning. Her name is not being released to protect the identity of the child. Now we're going to Eric Bay, who is on location today. Once again, we are back here at the Economic Partnership Summit here in Lloyd Minster. And now Jim Boucher joins me and you just spoke here. So can you talk a little bit about what your message was here today? My message uh, is that the oil resource industry and uh, First Nation communities can work well together and that they, we can develop mutually beneficial relationships uh, where all the, all the issues are addressed related to environmental and social impacts and uh, there's economic opportunities for our people in the community. There's also development opportunities for our people as well as the oil industry with respect to who the partners that we work with and that uh, the way to do this is develop agreements and to make sure that you develop the infrastructure in the community to, to be able to relate to the oil industry and provide a good service. So that's my message today. And now, especially in these kind of economic times as well, what's the importance, you know, of, of you mentioned there, that oil industry pairing that with Indigenous peoples? I, th I think it's important for the oil industry to recognize that they have a, a relationship and, a, and an obligation to, to, to present uh, good solutions to environmental issues and that we can work together to find these solutions to environmental issues, whether it's emissions and reduction of emissions or whether it's also in terms of improved performance. So I think that uh, the oil industry and the First Nation communities can take a, a message that, you know, we are, we're all working in this together and it's a common uh, goal for us to improve the community and I think we all have that interest in heart. And then just really quick here, this is, you mentioned your first time here at the Economic Partnership at Summit in Lloydminster. So what's the importance of these events and how have you enjoyed it here so far? I, I think it's really important for us to have these, uh, these conferences because it allows our people to get together and to exchange ideas and to find out what other people are doing and seeing what's successful and what's, what's not. And I think, you know, we need more successes in this country. Thank you for this, and we are going to have some more from back here at the Economic Partnership Summit throughout the show, but before that, we are going to head back into the studio. Well, our question of the day, many hockey fans chiming in. Obviously, it was an exciting night to start off for this area because the thing that most Lloydminster hockey fans are interested in when it comes to pro hockey is, of course, the Edmonton Oilers. Often their hopes have been dashed despite drafting so many great young players, but uh, off to a good start last night. So um, we, at least we have the, the, you know, the worry warts of the hockey world. They're satisfied for one night. Yeah, they're, they're put at bay for just a little bit longer. Who knows what's going to happen? Maybe they'll blow us all away. Who knows? Will the chances of that happening aren't very high, no. but who knows? It could happen. We could all be thrown for a loop and um, but let's just see when their next game is and see what happens. Yeah. And it's it, it comes down to really they have Connor McDavid. He's the best hockey player in the world. If he's not the best player in the world every single night, they basically don't have a chance to win. Yeah, exactly. You have to have that star player who's ready to go every single night. And typically he really is, you know, coming off of injuries or even, you know, he was sick for a few games right. last season, but he bounced back. And so when you have that player who is ready to go every single night and is in, his head is in the game when it's game time, they'll have no problem. Yeah. And we'll just have to see if they can manage the rest of the injuries that come in, of course, such as Adam Larson, who did injure his ankle and will not be around for a little bit. Um, fortunately, we don't have any injuries to report when it comes to our pets of the day, uh, although Bentley looks like something's wrong. Yes, definitely looks a little scared, but they're both super cute, so it's okay. Uh, next up here, Firefred. I love the name, and the dog is super cute, too. Followed up by Oakley. Looks like he's enjoying a nice car ride. That's very cute. And Django is looking out at something but not moving. I love the name and very has a very intense stare going on. Very cute. 
ending it up with Archie, who I know you approve of the fashion choice. Yes, the little bow tie is just so cute and just ties the look all together. Just an adorable cat. And we need picks like that plus the name for you have a chance to win that free gift card. We want to see your pets. Send photos of your pet and their name to our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to have them featured on Pet of the Day. Your name will be entered into a weekly draw for a gift certificate from the Pet Pad. In studio with me is the leadership core of the Lakeland Rustlers women's volleyball team. Sort of a new leadership core, even though you've all been with the team for several years now. Bailey Wheeler at right side, Brooklyn Bame and Avery Maginelle, the two starting middles. And uh, you've come off a really historic three-year run. Uh, how does it feel, and we'll start from my immediate left, just to be the new uh, veterans of the group when you guys were the youngsters a while ago? Um, it's definitely different, but um, it's exciting and yeah. Yeah, like I think it's kind of exciting to just have a new role on the team and like see where that can take you and from the girls who um, used to do those roles, kind of like who on our team is going to step up and fill those shoes. And you guys obviously have a pretty big tournament coming up here with the home tournament. You're going to have some pretty uh, top-notch squads such as the Briarcrest Clippers are coming mm -hmm. into town. Um, is this going to be one of the best chances to really see what your starting lineup looks like? Or is it just simply maybe one of the last stops of getting really good repetitions before the season? We'll, we'll Avery to start that. Uh, well, you know, it's preseason, so we're still obviously working through some kinks. But I think it'll be a good um, building block to see, like, who's going to step up and take some positions, but by no means do I think this will determine any starting lineup. Yeah, and one thing we had talked to Austin Dyer the few times we've seen him this fall is that even though, you know, there's this core of, there's still a core of veterans and you'd think there's really big holes to be filled because of losing players like Ray Sigurdsson, like Shelby Becker, Annika Coos, you have some pretty talented youngsters that are ready to play right away. Yeah, Jana, she's our setter coming up here. She's doing really good. Um, Maddie, Janae, um, they're doing really great, Mac as well. So it's exciting in practice. We definitely have a lot of, um, as Abe said, things to work through, but definitely the younger players are firing. It's really good to see and it's fun to practice with them. So, And Avery, with some of those things to work on, is a lot of it come down to ball control things? Because obviously your two starting left sides are gone. It's kind of just who figuring out can take the most load as a serve receive passer? That's definitely one of the main discussions we have in practice, just working through serve receive and who's going to be able to step up and talk. Mm -hmm. We talk about how what you need to do to be on the field, uh, on the floor, and Austin says one of the main things is definitely passing for okay. our left sides. And Brooklyn, between the three of you, the three of you don't actually do a lot of passing in the game, yeah. and you haven't over the last couple <laughs> of years. So, but as older players, you still essentially have to kind of lend a little bit of a hand in terms of the on-court vibe and stuff. So how do you kind of balance that without being able to be one of the people standing in the back row all the time? I mean, like, um, especially being in the middle, like, you're only on the court for three rotations. But um, I'd say, like, mostly I want to come out there um, with a positive vibe, but also with a competitive edge. So even though I don't pass, I still am always instructing our younger players, like, come on, we need to get the next one, like, always pushing them to be better on the next point. Okay. And it's not to say that you don't have some veteran influence outside of yourselves because, as we've uh, discussed on the program, Ray Sigurdsson, of course, is back as an assistant coach. And I know, Bailey, when I've talked to you in previous seasons, Ray was a big influence on um, being better defensively and as a blocker. And mm -hmm. obviously, you as sort of the de facto backup setter mm -hmm. had to model a lot of stuff after. What's it like having her on the bench now uh, versus as your kind of leader on the court? Yeah, no, it's definitely really good. You can always look to her for asking like cues on your block or even um, she's right beside our setters in practice, like telling us um, cues for setting, like where we're screwing up or not and stuff like that. So it's definitely going to be a huge bonus for us, I think, having her. For sure. And then mm -hmm. does, do you see that some of that competitive fire? Because you know, you know how obviously a competitive person yeah. she is, that there's a part of her like wants to get back out there. Oh yeah, like 100%. It's funny, like in individuals and stuff, stories come up of um, past years and stuff, but it's a good, it's going to be a change for her, but it's nice to have her there and um, pushing us and stuff. So, of course. Yeah. And she'll obviously be a big part in those in-game adjustments you have to make, starting with this weekend where they will take on a number of ACAC teams at the Lakeland Gymnasium.